Welcome everyone to the fifth in this online lecture series on new directions in the study of modern Hinduism, an initiative of the OCHS's Rethinking Hinduism in Colonial India uh, research project of the center. We're delighted to welcome as our speaker this week, uh, Professor um, Ishita Banerjee Dubey. Professor Banerjee Dubey is Professor of History at the Center for Asian and African Studies El, at um, El uh, Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City and a member of the National System of Researchers in Mexico, where she holds the highest rank. Her research in brief explores issues of religion, law and power, time and temporality, language and identity, gender and nation, food and emotion and democracy and social justice, often with a focus on the region of Eastern India. Her authored books include Divine Affairs, Religion, Law and Power, and most recently, A History of Modern India, published in 2015 by Cambridge University Press which is a 500 page plus tour de force that explores the processes that shaped modern India between the 18th and 20th centuries. Um, her current project on Odisha examines the imbrication of language and identity through the analysis of a 15th century audio rendering of the epic Mahabharata and the changing reception of the text and its author over time. In her talk for us today, Professor Banerjee Dubey will address the question of what is modern Hinduism? So um, I hand over to you, Ishita. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Lucian, and everyone else who's joined it. Thanks for the invitation, OCHS, for you to get, you know, for bringing me into this uh, conversation, which I have not been really a part of. And uh, so, yes, I would like to get your feedback on the way, you know, I'm proceeding. As, as Lucia mentioned, I'm also extremely um, concerned with what is happening in India right now. So maybe, you know, that may have affected the way I, I think about both Hinduism and modern Hinduism. But without further ado, but thanks a lot for, for you know, getting me this chance and for actually pushing me to think and go back to my earlier work on, on Mahima Dharma. So I'll, I'll begin without further ado. I'll read from the screen, but I guess you'd be able to see me as I read. Yeah. So. What is modern Hinduism, as you know, that's the title I put. Gavin Flood, the general editor of the Oxford History of Hinduism series, writes in his introduction to modern Hinduism that the term Hinduism is problematic because its origin dates back only to the 19th century. And Hindu is attested as a people's self-description only from the 16th century. At the same time, Flood affirms Hinduism denotes a range of traditions within India whose roots reach deep into the past. For David Smith, the author of Hinduism and Modernity, both the terms, that is Hinduism and modernity, are, and I quote, somewhat arbitrary intellectual constructs. Modernity is not a word used in ordinary speech nor is it simply the modern world or modern times. It is rather a theorization of the modern world. Hinduism in turn began as an extraneous external term for the indigenous religions of India, other than the reform movements that became separate, clearly identified religions, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. This is how, um, uh, David Smith uh, uh, writes, but on the other hand, we need to remember that Hardot Oberoi had told, you know, had written uh, very forcefully about the construction of religious boundaries of how Hindu, particularly Hinduism and Sikhism become separated only from the end of the 19th century, which becomes even more clear in the, you know, in the 20th. Anyway, so before we proceed, therefore, I would like to take a step back and examine what we mean by religion. Religion is believed to be derived from the Latin religio, meaning respect, and within quotes for the sacred, or relig religier, or religere, I don't know how to pronounce it, meaning an obligation to show respect for what is sacred. 
Following Durkheim, it is defined as, and I quote, a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, set apart and forbidden, be, uh, forbidden beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them, unquote. In the quotidian arena, we are told, religion is associated with places of worship, a synagogue or church, with a practice, confession or meditation, and with a concept that guides the daily lives, like dharma or sin. Religion is acknowledged to be a system of beliefs, values, and practices concerning what a person holds sacred, or considers to be spiritually significant. History of religions also accepts religion as a tidy category composed of organized beliefs, practices, and doctrines. In other words, religion is also, to use David Smith's uh, terms, an intellectual construct that confers on religion an ahistorical essence, an innate sacredness that separates it from power and politics and the secular. Taking another tack, we also need to explore the origin and connotations of the different isms to probe what we mean by Hinduism. If we follow Reinhard Koselleck, a leading fig figure of the history of concepts or conceptual history with Griff's Geschichte, isms predominated as political concepts in the modern political language that evolved in Germany roughly between 1750 and 1850. Isms expressed future expectations and were used in forming ideological positions. Palmer and Colton's classic, A History of the Modern World, published in 1950, had also affirmed that without the isms, um, that surfaced in the 30 odd years after the peace of Vietnam, 1814-15, Vienna, sorry, sorry, after the peace of Vienna, 1814-15, it is impossible to understand or even talk about the history of the world. They had defined isms as doctrines and movements of many sorts. Although isms and ideology are constantly paired together, the two are not the same. Ideologies, moreover, were in existence before isms appeared in the political language of Europe. In an essay on isms and ideologies, Kurunmeki and Marhanen indicate that ideology initially referred to an enlightenment program of developing a new science for the categorizing and teaching of ideas. However, Napoleon's rhetoric soon politicized the ideologue's positivist approach and ideas became synonymous with illusion, paving the way for a pejorative use of ideology in political language. Ideology and isms got intertwined and isms served to discredit ideas, people or movements or to claim or forge intellectual traditions. So in my intervention today, I will probe the consequences of the use of an ism in the forging of an intellectual tradition that accepts Hinduism almost as a self-evident category with some recognizable beliefs, practices, and principles. Does a Hindu way of life or the divergent ways of being Hindu conform to an ism? If yes, what is the interface of the Hindu way of life and Hinduism as a doctrine and ideology? What are the implications of such interaction and intersection? If Hindu gained currency as a way of people's self-description only from the 16th century, what was this self-description or ascription a part of? A new awareness, consciousness of ethical conduct tied to the early modern? In other words, 
I wish to share with you the many issues that the combined term modern Hinduism raises in order to push ourselves to reflect critically on the wide ranging repercussions of concepts and categories that necessarily form a part of our thought. Modernity for David Smith is the encrustation of modern times with a kind of secular theology. Modern, modernity has an ethics, a logic and an ontology. Modernity for me is a composite admixture of divergent and fractured processes over the 16th, 17th and 18th century, centuries in certain parts of Europe tied to the Renaissance, Reformation and Enlightenment and sustained by the age of discovery, conquest and colonization. Processes that produced a worldview that demarcated peoples and places as modern and traditional or backward, advanced and primitive, scientific and superstitious, and in other hierarchical binaries, all based on an evolutionary schema motored by the notion of progress. Modernity evolved out of the reworking of the relationship between God, nature, and the human, with a new emphasis on the, uh, on the human and human reason and science, and processes of secularization of time that demarcated a divine or enchanted past from a real human present. History in this sense, as we know, Kosalek also says, is, is, is a record of, is totally influenced by the activities, actions of humans. Okay, so it, uh, it, uh, it does not bear pointing out that starting from the late 18th century, British, uh, various British scholars and administrators and occasionally continental European figures began to sketch immense comparative vistas on which they placed Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin cultures at varying points on an evolutionary continuum, which was said to have culminated in the ideals of and the institutions of modernity. It is important to remember in this context, the prescient distinction made by Talal Asad between the secular as an episteme secularization as a process and secularism as a normative doctrine of the modern. This normative inflection of the modern creates and recreates tradition and the medieval in discrete ways, just as secularism as a doctrine constructs and demarcates the religious. If we keep all this in mind, we would probably be able to approach religion, Hinduism, tradition, power, and politics, and their innumerable blends in distinct ways. Modern Hinduism encapsulates both the construct of Hinduism as a rational scientific doctrine with well-defined contours and a valorization of diverse ways of life uh, as part of an ongoing tradition with a linear chronological history. I look into the consequences of such encapsulation by drawing upon my own work on what used to be a radical marginal dharma of Orissa, Eastern India. Let me begin with the first report on this new faith uh, published in Utkal Dipa which is the first um, vernacular Odia newspaper. The Utkal Dipika of 1st June 1867 reported that a new faith was spreading in the princely states bordering Katak. It had been founded by a Halahari of Sanyasi, an ascetic who survived on fruits, who lived on Kapiras Hill in Thenkanal. The ascetic had initially subsisted on fruits, later had drunk milk, but in the end, he lived only on water. He worshipped Shiva. One day, on the directions of Shunya, 
the great void, he cut off his matted locks and gave up his vocation as a mere renouncer. He began wearing the bark of a tree and spread a dharma that disregarded caste distinctions, forbid idol, wor uh, idol worship and rituals, for example, shraddha, death rites and ceremonies, and advocated a belief in one Ishwara, God. The sannyasi was described as Uti Nirlo, completely free of greed, and praised for his efforts to feed people at a time of scarcity. 1866-67, um, coastal Orissa and other parts also went through a devastating famine, and which was thought of to be, you know, which was taken to be a result both of, uh, you know, natural and man-made causes. So 1866, and we get the first report in 1867. So he was praised for his efforts to feed people at a time of scarcity. This sannyasi constructed large temporary houses where he fed 40 to 50,000 people. Seems like a huge exaggeration because I don't think he ever managed to, to get that amount of money to feed people given uh, his practices, but we'll come to that in a minute. He constructed large temporary houses where he fed 40 to 50,000 people. He then burnt these houses and moved on at will. He was said to command great respect. These bare details, as they are set out in the first report of the newspaper, underwent embellishments and mutations over the next 50 years during the construction and legitimization of the figure of Mohima Swami, the founder of Mohima Dharma. Utkardipika also provided a second report six years later in 1873. By now, the this Parahari Sanyasi had become Mohima Babaji, and his preaching and practices had started causing concern. Why had they started causing concern? Because he asked only for uh, cooked rice as arms, and he ate it together with his followers uh, from the same pot. In addition, he was also accepting this cooked rice from all households, including that of uh, the Christians and Dalits, but he refused to accept uh, cooked rice from the Raja, the Brahman, the Raja, and the washerman, the Dhoba, and the barber. We can leave the, you know, the in implications of these practices for the discussion. Okay, but uh, uh, the second report stated very clearly that the practices of this uh, Babaji was, uh, you know, causing concern, had uh, aroused the ire of the local rulers, and uh, because they were all out to destroy, his, these practices were out to destroy Jati Dharma, and the ruler of Madhupur had, uh, had uh, you know, um, ostracized him or thrown him out of his territory, him and his followers out of his territory. The Deepika, it's very interesting, also expressed his loyalist uh, sentiments by saying that as long as these practices and these, uh, you know, the followers, what they were doing, were uh, confined only to the tributary states, the princely states of Orissa, it was all right. But what would happen if they spread also the, to the parts of British Orissa? Again, this is something we can take up during the discussion. The Baptist missionaries, also went through a good deal of inquiry and difficulty, I quote from their report, to meet the new religious leader. And they were impressed by what they saw. And I quote, we found him to be a man of perhaps 60 years of age, tall and thin, with an intelligent and benevolent countenance, unquote. Reverend Miller looked upon this man favorably as the person who was paving the way for the spread of Christianity. He called him Dhuli Babaji and felt that the name had originated from this teacher's habit, habit of sleeping on bare ground. He further stressed that this ascetic never sleeps two nights at, in one place and is constantly on the move among his followers. The Babaji was commended as a very abstemious man. He has but one meal a day, drinks only water or milk, never indulges in narcotics. He denounces idolatry, caste, the Brahmins, the use of narcotics and spirituous liquors. He inculcates the worship of the creator and preserver of the world and the practice of devotion to God, truth, charity and chastity. 
colonial administrators asked to inquire into the beliefs and practices of the people who, I quote unquote, attacked the temple of Jagannath in March 1881, were the first to embark on a project of constructing a life history of the founder of Mohima Dharma. Their writings drew upon local traditions that had gathered around the renouncer, but they consciously tried to forsake myths in an attempt to provide an accurate account. Mohima Swami was dead by 1881. He, had, he was meant to have died in 1875 or 76 anyway. So the colonial administrators tried to forsake myths in an attempt to provide an accurate account. In legend history and myths, Adhulia or Dhuli Babaji, a Palahari Sanyasi, and the Shira Nirapai, one who drinks milk and water, seem to call us in the figure of Mohima Swami. Administrative reports refer to these three different epithets of the founder, but claim that they refer to separate stages of his life, thereby negating the possibility of a conflation of identity. Their accounts allow us to identify three phases in the life of this religious leader who had become deified in his lifetime as an avatar of or incarnation of the Alek Absolute whose Mahima, radiance or glory, he preached. Colonial administrators also tried to ascribe the preacher's deification to the ignorance and superstition of illiterate subordinate peoples. On the other hand, the very daring act of the attack on the temple of Jagannath, the Rashtra Devata of Orissa for centuries, conducted by a group of very ordinary men and women from the Sambalpur regions and the practices of the followers of this new dharma found entry into the final report uh, that was published in the Proceedings of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1882 as on a sect of Hindu dissenters who profess to be the followers of Alek, on a sect of Hindu dissenters. The report coalesced several references to an itinerant ascetic in the figure of Mukundodas, who had come to be called Mahima Swami by his followers as a preacher and called the faith Alek Dharma. A graphic illustration of the straight jacketing of diverse ways of life and conduct within the overarching scheme of Hindu or Hinduism. At the same time, the deification of Mahima Swami, we need to remember, was a result of the influential presence of the concept metaphor of Kali Yuga, the last and the most evil of the four eras, according to classical Hinduism, among ordinary peoples of Orissa. The long-lasting Kali Yuga, we know, is meant to be brought to an end by the appearance of an avatar, I mean, a human incarnation of the divine, who will purge the world of sins through a devastating war, annihilate Kali, and re-establish Satya Dharma, true faith, heralding Satya Yuga, the pristine era of truth. This belief, current in the Vaishnavite tradition and mentioned in the Puranas, gained wide currency in Odisha from the late 16th century through the appearance of and circulation of Malikas, apocryphal texts that were ascribed to the Poncho Shakhas, the five eminent medieval mystics, the five friends, Poncho Shakhas. Malikas and texts of a similar vein, written in verse in the form of a dialogue, easy to recite in larger gatherings of people without formal education, not only concretized the intermingling of great and little traditions, if we still use those earlier formulations, and the oral and the written, they kept alive and rendered acutely palpable the notion of Kali and Kali Yuga. This made the imminent destruction of the evil age by the arrival of an incarnation immensely probable. Belief in the divinity of Mohima Swami caused serious crisis when he died in 1875-76. He was not meant to die. A large and disparate group of adherents initiated into monastic and lay orders by the uh, guru preacher were left without a nominated successor, permanent structures and written precepts. At this time of crisis, Bhima Bhoi, a blind, unlettered, khond, um, kondho, Adivasi poet emerged as a leader in Western Orissa. 
he was bestowed with the eyesight of knowledge by the Swami to compose inspired verses in praise of the absolute and of the preceptor. The couplets noted down by Brahman scribes came to constitute the theosophy philosophy of the faith. More importantly, they were sung in collective gatherings of bhaktas and aided the construction of a Mohima Dharmi community. Mima Bhoi aroused the ire of the renouncers of the dharma by taking to the life of a householder and by initiating women into the monastic order. He cut off his links with Jorondha in Dhenkanal, where the ascetics decided to construct a samadhi memorial for the guru. He established his own ashram in Khadeyapalli near Sonpur in Western Orissa and emerged as the leader of a large group of followers who gradually came to regard him as the founder of the faith and an incarnation of the absolute. His life became a rich source of legends and his compositions were apprehended in diverse ways. The replacement of a mobile preceptor by a static memorial heralded the institutionalization of the faith. The memorial grew into a huge complex. I'm speaking of the ascetics now and the, and the headquarters, the Mohima Gadi in Jorondha in Dhenkana. So the replacement of a mobile preceptor by a static memorial heralded the institutionalization of the faith. The memorial grew into a huge complex with rituals and ceremonies and an annual pilgrimage and emerged as the, as the Gadi headquarters of Mohima Dharma. <coughs> Two groups of renouncers fought over the right to offer services at the Gadi complex and took to law courts that further speeded the process of institutionalization. Formal histories of the faith were written and the Dharma's relationship with high Hinduism was reworked. Mohima Dharma gradually evolved as a sect within Hinduism even though the lay followers have integrated the teachings, integrated and internalized the teachings and practices of Mohima Swami and Bhima Bhoi in newer ways, in ever newer ways to maintain their separate existence. Now, with the political, social and cultural predominance of the Hindu right, the headquarters at Jaranda has increasingly come under the influence of the Hindu right and become a part of Sanatan Hinduism that is at once modern, scientific, supreme, and superior. During my very recent visit to Sambalpur, members of the Sanskrit department of the Gangadhar Meher University that, has invited, that had invited me insisted that there are clear traces of Vedic thought in Bhima Bhoi. Bhima Bhoi, it's, it bears mention, has a composition that's called Nirveda Sadhana, a, a sadhana that is without the Vedas anyway. But they insisted that there are clear traces of, um, of the Vedic thought in Bhima Bhoi. Local intellectuals and political leaders, on the other hand, have become instrumental in instituting Bhima Bhoi chairs in different universities and institutes contributing to the canonization of Bhima Bhoi in a different way. Let me end then by posing questions that will push us to critically reconsider some of our own assumptions. What does it mean to be Hindu in a modern way? What do the ongoing articulations of lived traditions in a changing world tell us? What are the dangers of constructing doctrines and ideologies that underlie isms and are bolstered by the hierarchical normative antinomies of the modern? And what are their possibilities? Thank you. <laughs>